One of my heroes in the ministry was a minister in Indianapolis by the name of Russ Blowers. Russ was training in, during the end of World War II to be a, in the 8th Air Force as a pilot in the P-51 Mustang an attack plane that was used in World War II. Interestingly enough, the war ended before he could go over to Europe and be used in, in the war effort. But he's truly one of my heroes. A young minister wrote him and said, I'm just about to begin serving my first church. What advice do you have for me? Here's what he wrote. Hit the ground running. Show people how to be a servant. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, Philippians 2.5. Major in preaching. Spend time with the older folks in the church. Pray longer than you watch TV. That would interrupt somebody's schedule today, perhaps. Pray longer than you would watch TV. Remember, the little church in your house deserves some of your time also. Work hard. Love people. Be an encourager. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Listen to God's word. Watch your moral step. Cry some. Laugh a lot. Don't keep a record of offenses done to you or said against you. Donate some of your time to projects outside the local church. Abide in Christ because you see without Him you can't do anything. Don't ever think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Try to win over with love and prayers. The EGRs has nothing to do with your car. An EGR, it has to do with extra grace required kind of people. Stay put. Don't get entangled in business deals. Put a mirror in front of the pulpit to remind yourself that you too are a sinner saved by grace. Pursue excellence. Lose your pride. Lose your pride and pursue humility. Now, the one that I left out, I left one of them in, purposely that was up earlier in the list. He said, don't have a private parking space with your name on it. That's always been a pet peeve of mine. Just for the record, I parked down by the dumpster behind the building on Sunday mornings. Not that that makes me special. I'm just telling you that's where I park. I've never believed in having a parking space with your name on it. And the ultimate example to me of that is Bob Russell, who would preach to 15, 17, 18,000 people on Sunday morning. You know, or he would park in a remote lot, and he would ride a shuttle bus into the church. And that spoke volumes to me. He could have had it easily, and I would have understood a parking space for somebody preaching to 18,000 people on Sunday, but he parked in the remote lot. It spoke volumes about him as a person. Why am I talking about Russ Blower's advice to a young minister for this reason? We're in a series called Blueprint. It's written from the, it's from the book of 1 Timothy, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young minister named Timothy who's a minister at a place called Ephesus. The Apostle John was the founding minister of the church at Ephesus. What, what an honor to say our church was founded by the Apostle John. And Timothy was the minister who followed him, perhaps. And that's, we're studying his advice to Timothy. It's in chapter 4 today, 1 Timothy 4, uh, beginning at verse 9. 1 Timothy 4, beginning at verse 9. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And for this we labor and strive that we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in five areas. Listen carefully. Five areas that speak to every husband and father. Five areas that speak to every wife and mother, every single person, every son, every daughter, every person who works, every person who goes to school. I think you get the point for everybody. Five areas of your life and my life where we're to be an example to other people. Here they are. In speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Don't neglect your gift. What gift? Preaching and teaching. Just mentioned in 13. Which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine. Watch your behavior and what you believe closely. Persevere in them because if you do, 
you will save both yourselves and your hearers. When's the last time that you gave someone advice? Can you think of a time even in the last week where you maybe put your hand on somebody's shoulder? And you could be young yourself. You could be in your 20s, but you gave somebody some advice. When's the last time that somebody put a hand on your shoulder and said, let me give you a little advice? We all remember those moments. And yet I want you to know that what Paul gave, the advice he gave to Timothy, can change your marriage today. You really mean that, Randy? I really mean that. What Paul told a young minister named Timothy can change the way you relate to your children, by the way you relate to your parents, by the way you relate to coworkers. It can have a dramatic impact on your life, and most people don't get that. Let's talk about verse 9. He says, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. I never use that phraseology, but you heard, you heard me last week use a phrase I use all the time. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. And that's what Paul's saying here. Here's a trustworthy saying. If you don't remember anything else, remember this, that we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men, verse 10, and especially those of those who believe. This may sound like an oversimplistic statement, but I think it's true. You either put your hope as a man or woman in the living God or you put your hope in something less, a lot less. And just because people go to church doesn't mean they put their hope in the living God. It doesn't mean anything. And I don't say that sarcastically at all. It's just true. There are people who are faithful church attenders but put their trust in their paycheck. There are people who attend church every week and they put their trust in the system. They put their trust in their portfolio. They put their trust in what they own. They put their trust in anything and everything but the living God. And there comes that Kodak moment in a man's life when he says, I think I need to start putting my hope in the living God. There's that dramatic moment in a woman's life who said, all my life I've been putting my trust and my confidence in so many things but the living God. But starting today, at age 40, at age 50, at age 70 or 80, I'm going to put my hope in the living God. And you know what? God will honor that, regardless of your age. And then in verse 12, he says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, life, love, faith, and purity. Listen carefully. I really think this is important, what I'm going to say. You don't demand respect from people. You earn it by your example. You don't earn authority. You you earn it by people seeing your example. And that's the gist of what Paul's saying. He said, uh, Timothy, you want to have respect? You want to have some measure of authority in the body of Christ? Earn it with your example. And he sets out five things. I want to talk about all of them briefly. First of all, speech. Do you find it interesting, like I do, that the first thing he mentions is speech? You ever met a man or woman? Maybe you were dating. Maybe you had a date like this where everything seemed great until you saw him get mad and you said, man, I didn't know he would talk like that. Or the reverse. You went out with her and and, and you heard her say some things that, man, That sure doesn't fit the image that I had of that woman. Speech reveals what's inside. And you know, Jesus would say the strongest things I've ever heard anyone say about words. He said, by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Anytime I hear somebody, like I heard a rock musician years ago defending the filthy lyrics of their song, particular group, and I can't even tell you what group it was, but he was defending the filthy lyrics by saying this, hey, get over it. They're just words. Somebody forgot to tell God that. He didn't get that memo. By your words, Jesus said, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. And isn't it interesting, the first thing Paul says out of the gate, you want to be an example, Timothy, to the congregation, watch how you talk. Watch the words you say. Speech has power. Think of all the words in your life. And here's what's interesting. I I heard a man speak years ago from Chile, from South America, a businessman, who's talking about the power of our words. And he said, said, if you don't think words are important, he, he was talking to a group of business people. And he said, some of you are still wounded. 
by the hateful words of a dad. And some of you women still carry scars from your mom. You carry scars from verbal scars, things that were said. Forget about abuse or physical abuse or whatever. He said, just think about words. Words have power in people's lives. And Paul said, be an example, number one, in speech. Then he said, be an example, Timothy, in life, just the way you conduct your life. Uh, it has to do with your personal conduct. Here's, here's a surprise or a newsflash for somebody. People watch you in ways that you're not even aware of. If you don't think people watch how you act, you're wrong. And I don't say that arrogantly. People watch you, if, particularly if they know you're a believer, Get this, they watch how you talk to your wife. They watch how you talk to your husband. They watch how you talk to your children. They watch how you talk to fellow employees. They observe things about you in your life, where you go. This is embarrassing, and in fact, I may even edit this out of the radio. There are things, by the way, that I say that I edit out of the radio because I just, I just feel uncomfortable, and this may be one of them, but I don't mind sharing it here. Twice in my lifetime, twice, one of them in another city, I saw a man that I knew with a woman other than his wife. Now, you think, you talk about embarrassing to run into your minister. You know, I've tried to put myself in their shoes, and that happened to me twice over a lot of years in two different places, two different cities, but it happened, and I, and I felt so badly for the person because you can imagine the conversations that ensued later when I knew the phone was going to ring, you know, a day or two later, and it did in both cases. And you can imagine the embarrassment, but life, people watch us, and people watch us that we don't even know are, are watching us is our point. Speech, life, and love. How do you express love to the people that are close, closest to you? This is going to sound shocking or stupid or something to somebody. But don't talk about the love that you have for your wife or husband or your children when you never express it. Don't talk about the love that you have for your spouse, your children, your parents, and your family, and you never express it. Love that's not expressed is not experienced. Write that down. Love that's not expressed is not experienced. You are an example in the way you love people or the way you withhold your love. Faith, an example in faith. People notice what we believe. They notice how we express that belief, how we model that belief, how we live it out in everyday life and in purity. People watch purity in a world that's very impure, in a world that doesn't give a flip about how people conduct their lives. It makes a difference when you call yourself a follower of Christ, how you conduct your personal life. Purity has to do with ethics and morality. You fill in the blanks. You fill in the blanks. Then in verse 13, he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. That's it. He didn't tell uh, Timothy, you need to learn this leadership style, and you need to find out your personality type. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, you need to go to this seminar, that seminar. Dedicate yourself to three things, Timothy. The public reading of Scripture. Why? That's where the power is in the Word of God. It's not in our ideas, it's in the Word of God, to preaching and teaching. Don't neglect this gift that was given to you at your ordination. Then in verse 14, or 15, he says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, or to them so that everyone may see your progress, watch your life and your doctrine closely, how you live your life and, and what you believe. You know, what you believe is important for this reason. Tell me what you believe about the resurrection and I'll tell you what kind of man you are. Tell me what you believe about the resurrection and I'll tell you what kind of woman you are. Tell me what you believe about life after death. Tell me what you believe about personal ethics from Scripture. And you start telling me and other people what kind of person you are because of what we believe. It does matter what you believe. It does matter how you conduct your life, and you've got the Lord God Almighty telling you that's the case today. I told a story that I want to share with you in this service told by Fred Muster. I have no idea if he's still alive, where he is as a minister. I really love this story. 
It really illustrates some powerful things out of this message. He said, a few days before I left home to prepare for the ministry, my minister, a man by the name of Pastor Temple, told me this story out of his own life. I get the picture. Fred Muster is about to go off to either Bible college or seminary to prepare for ministry. His older minister comes to him with this story. Fred says, I've told this story many times since. Pastor Temple said to him, uh, Fred, when my son was small, we often walked together through the fields and the neighboring fields behind the parsonage. At first, the little fellow would hold on to my little finger. Get the picture. Dad's putting out his little finger. Some of you can relate to that with your child. And his son is holding on to his hand by holding on to his little finger. But he found that when they stepped into a hoof print in the ground or stumbled over something, his grip would fail and he'd go down in the dust or snow. Pastor Temple said, I didn't give it much thought, and my mind was on other matters. I would always stop when my son would fall. I'd help brush him off, grab my, have him grab my little finger again, gripping it a little harder this time, and we'd go off continuing the walk. And then he said this. This is powerful. One time after four or five falls, the little boy, not the dad, but the little boy says, Dad, I think if you would hold my hand, I wouldn't fall. I think if you would hold my hand, I wouldn't fall. Pastor Temple turned to me, Fred says, with tears in his eyes, and he said, you know, he still stumbled many times after that, but he never hit the ground. He never hit the ground. He stumbled many times after that, but he never hit the ground. What's that have to do with 1 Timothy 4? Everything. Your example to me is the way you hold people's hand. You put out your hand, not they're holding onto your little finger, but you're holding their hand by the way you talk. You're holding onto their hand by the way you live your life. You're holding onto their hand by the way you love people, what you believe, and your personal ethics and purity. That's how you hold the hand of other people. I think the illustration works. I really do. Isn't it interesting, of all the things that Paul could have told a young minister in a wicked city, I mean, it's a wicked city, Ephesus, very immoral. He said, Timothy, all I'm going to tell you, you're not going to win respect by demanding it. You're not going to win respect or authority by demanding it and telling people, you better respect me. He said, you're going to earn it by your example in five areas. Now, here's the question. This, all the sermon comes down to this. What would happen in your home this week, this week, as a husband, father, single dad, you applied the, those principles to the five things in your life. What would happen in your marriage? What would happen in your home as a mother, wife and mother, or as a single mom, saying, I'm going to be an example to my kids. This, this is one thing I can do. We don't have a lot of money, but I can be an example in the way I talk. I'm going to go on a lot of trips, but I can be an example the way I love them. We don't have a fancy car, but I can be an example the way I conduct my life in my faith and in my personal purity. Not perfect, but the basic direction of my life is the purity of, of God, my behavior. And then Paul said this when he closed. He said, watch your life and doctrine closely. Do you know what most people watch closely? Their checkbook. You know what most people watch closely? Facebook. You know what most people watch closely? Their other social media accounts. What's my image like? What do people think of me? What's their perception of us or me? And Paul just says to Timothy, watch your life. Watch what you believe closely. It makes all the difference in the world. Decide. Decide today that I'm going to be a man or woman who specializes in watching how I conduct my life in five ways. Not how people perceive me to be, but how I really am. Speech, life, love, faith, and purity. Make that decision today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us today through 1 Timothy 4. This has been a powerful book of the Bible for my life and to every person that's heard these messages. I really believe that. You're speaking to people where they live. This is not theoretical stuff. This is not 
pie in the sky theology. This is real life where people live in 2015. Bless people who need to come today for whatever reason, ultimately to give their life to Christ if people need to have prayer like we did for Chris. We, that's powerful what we did with Chris as we sent him on his way to the hospital in Cincinnati knowing that he has been prayed for personally and his friend Joe is being prayed for right now and that means a lot to people because you're involved in that. Bless this decision time, whatever reasons people need to come or respond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.